couple things as the, as the kids go to their class. First of all, uh, don't forget parents that we are now bringing them back up uh, and uh, at the end of the service so you can pick them up in the foyer when the service is over. Uh, you don't have to go down to the gym to do that. So I just wanted to, to remind you that. Uh, please make sure that you read your bulletin, the, the things that are in there. We, we don't have time to go through everything that's listed, but uh, we want you to be a part of as much as you can. I will say this. Uh, remember that the teenagers, the, the snow tubing trip, you need to get your, your money in. Uh, today, I think, is the deadline to, to Matt and Jenny. And if you're new and you don't know who they are and you would like to go, come see me and I'll, I'll find them for you and uh, let you know how you can get signed up for that. Did you breathe the same sigh of relief at the end of this, ser this last series that I did? <laughs> it was one of those things where it's, it's, it's important, it's necessary, it's stuff we need to talk about, but it's just not the easiest stuff. To talk about. So I, I'm kind of glad to be transitioning into a new series this week. And we're going to, to take a, a journey with Jesus. As we lead up to Easter at the end of next month, we're going to spend some time looking at some of, of the most important moments in Jesus' ministry, some of the encounters that we had. We kind of got you know started with that idea last week when we saw his encounter with the woman caught in adultery. Uh, but we're, we're going to start, we're going to go back a little farther and start toward the beginning and, and move, move forward. And with where we were in our Sunday school class today in Matthew, where, where Jesus came to, to, uh, to be baptized, it, it, was, it was a perfect start to where we are going to be. And what we're going to talk about today specifically is the idea of temptation. And I don't know about you, but for me... Temptation is all about stuff that benefits me, or that I, I at least at least I think they'll benefit me. I I get I, I don't get tempted. I don't use the word tempted to to say, well, you know, I'm going to give it. I'm going to sacrifice a day and go help somebody who needs something done. Right? I don't get tempted to write a big check to somebody who has a need or to a ministry. Uh, that, that has a need. I don't get tempted to do those things. I get tempted to do the things that benefit me. Um, and, and, and so that, that's, that's kind of the way I, I think we are about temptation is, is we look at it as the stuff that benefits me. I get tempted to eat ice cream. Uh, I get tempted to go and, and buy the, the latest gadget. But, and so we, we, we don't get, we, we don't get tempted, like you don't get tempted to eat kale, right? <laughs> you don't get tempted for that. By the way, I came across a great recipe for kale the other day. It, it's wonderful. You saute the kale in a pan with olive oil, and that makes it nice and easy to slide right out of the pan into the trash can. So, <laughs> works perfectly. <laughs> but you don't get tempted to eat Brussels sprouts or asparagus, do you? You get tempted to eat ice cream. You get tempted to eat cheesecake. But here's the thing, is that, that those, those temptations aren't usually helpful if they are prolonged. The things that we get tempted to do, if, you, if you're tempted to eat uh, ice cream and that's all you ever eat, you're probably not going to make it to your 30th birthday. If you're spending all your money on the latest gadgets, and I say this with Apple's Vision Pro in mind because I'm a gadget freak, if you spend all your money on all the latest gadgets, then you may not have enough money to pay your rent. Or maybe you can pay your rent, but you get down toward your later years and you haven't put anything aside for retirement. And so doing those things that benefit me can hurt me in the long run, the things that, that I like that are just about me, those things can hurt me in the long run. And Jesus understands this, and I think it's something we all understand to a degree. But Jesus comes along and he says that, that if you make, you spend your life making it all about you, and you spend your life focused on serving yourself, then in the end, you don't just hurt yourself, 
He says, you actually lose yourself. And so throughout the series, we're going to keep looking at Jesus, and we're going to see some interesting things about him. We're going to see that he's not just changing the old covenant. He's not just changing the Judaism. He's not, he's not introducing Judaism 2.0 that's revised and updated. He's, he's doing something completely new, uh, a new covenant that's going to be completely different from the way things are, were done in the culture, Think the way things are done nowadays as well, where those who have power focus on themselves instead of the ones that power can benefit. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to, to Matthew chapter uh, Matthew chapter 3, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 3 is where we were in Sunday school. That's where I've been for the last hour. Um, Matthew chapter 4. And to give you just kind of a background, right before this is where Jesus came to be baptized by the one who was there to introduce him, to make way the, the path of, of, for the Lord. Uh, and that was John. We call him John uh, the, the Baptist, John the Baptizer. And Jesus came, and John said, here's the one I, taught, I told you about, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And not just for the Jews, not just for Israel, but the sins of the entire world. That's something. That's an idea that to most Jews was foreign to them. And so this is, this is something new. And Jesus comes, and he goes down into the water, to be baptized, and this is where John says, wait, wait, wait a minute, and, and, and kind of leans in and says, this isn't right, me, me baptizing you, you're, you're the Messiah, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, this is the way it needs to be. Again, another sign that he's doing things completely upside down from the way the world is used to them being, the ones who have the power and the authority, not using it for their own benefit, but for others and, and humbling themselves. And so Jesus says, no, 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 this, this needs to happen. This, this, this will fulfill righteousness and you need to baptize me. And so reluctantly, John does that. And then there's kind of a twist in the story. Because just when you would expect John to say, okay, folks, uh, now, that, now that we've taken care of that, here's the one I've been pointing you toward. Here's the one I've been here to introduce you to. And you kind of expect Jesus to step up in that moment okay, and go, okay, John, thank you so much. You did such a great job. You can step back now. It's my time. That's kind of what you would expect. That's what the world would expect. But that's not what happened. Scripture says that right after that, Jesus slipped off to the wilderness and it was kind of one of those, here he is, but where'd he go? Type moments. Because you would kind of expect Jesus to step up and take over for John, but that's not what happens. He doesn't put the spotlight on himself. He slips away to the wilderness and look at the reason why. It says that he was there for, it says in in, uh, in in, in Matthew 4, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And the word that's used there for devil is the word diabolos, which is where we get our word diabolical. And it means the slanderer, the accuser. And Luke's Gospel tells us that he was tempted for 40 days. Not just here at, at the end of that time. I, I don't know about you, but it wasn't until recent years that I had caught that Jesus was tempted for the whole 40 days. I don't know why. I guess I was just focused on the ones that, that Scripture lists specifically here in Matthew. But uh, I was I just for some reason had thought, okay, he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And then and Satan came and tempted him when he was at his weakest. But Luke's Gospel tells us that he was tempted the whole 40 days and 40 nights. So it wasn't just a matter of him being physically weak from fasting for that long, but 
he hadn't been emotionally drained as well because for that 40 days, Satan was there tempting him that whole time. And verse 2 of Matthew 4 says, After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Anybody kind of scratch their heads when they read that and go, was that really necessary to say? It's one of those verses that you kind of look at and go, that may be the, mo the most unnecessary verse in all of Scripture. Because most of us, if we miss a meal, like, honestly, how many of you who participated in our, in our time of fasting for, for our next-gen minister these last two weeks, uh, how many of you who either fasted for a full day or even skipped a meal when it got time for that next meal, you're going, I'm starving. I did. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I got to the end of the day and, and, and I, was, I was looking at it going, how much longer till midnight? And I said a day. That's, that's, you know, midnight's the end of the day. How long? Because I'm starving. And we'll say that when we've, when we're, you know, we've maybe missed a meal or sometimes even when we're just late for a meal. Jesus fasted for 40 days, and he was hungry. And so you look at that and you go, is that really necessary? But it is necessary because it sets the stage for the next temptation that Satan was going to, to put in front of him. Verse 3 says this, the tempter came to him. And again, that word in the, in the original language, the word tempter, it means the inquisitor, the tester, the prodder, the tempter, came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, Tell these stones to become bread. In other words, if you're really the Son of God, you can do this. All you have to do is speak. God spoke the world into existence. He didn't have to do anything but speak. And the world was created. If you're really the Son of God, you can speak to these rocks and produce food for you. You've got to be hungry. It's been 40 days. You've got to be hungry. And he puts that temptation in front of Jesus. You know, Satan's always going to find a weakness to exploit. And my weakness may be different from your weakness. But he's going to look and he's going to find a weakness to exploit. And Jesus responds to this temptation by quoting scripture. Verse 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And so he quotes from Deuteronomy and describes when, when the Israelites were in the desert, in the wilderness... And there wasn't enough food, and, and God provided manna from heaven. And God's point with that was that you need to learn to depend on me, not yourselves. You need to learn to depend on me. And so Jesus quotes that scripture back to Satan. And he says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And he goes on, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, I'm not going to just act for my own benefit. I'm not going to act just to benefit me. I want to do what God's will is. Verse 5 goes on and says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. Now, the highest point of the temple was the, the southeast corner. And from that southeast corner of the temple, you would look down hundreds and hundreds of feet to the Kidron Valley. In fact, Jewish historian Josephus said that if you stood there at that southeast corner and looked down for any length of time, you'd get dizzy because it was so high. And Satan comes and, and tells him that, that, uh, that he brings him to the highest point at the temple and says this in verse 6, If you're the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. And then he, and then he quotes scripture. Satan quotes from Psalm 91. He says, For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike foot against a stone. Now, some people see this as Satan taunting Jesus. Oh, come on. Are you really, are you really the Son of God? Well, I double-dog dare you to jump off of this because if you're really the Son of God, Scripture says... He's not going to let you fall and hit the ground and be hurt. So I mean, come on, let's prove it. You, you, you're supposed to be the son of God? Let's prove it. I dare you. That's the way some people see this. 
other people look at it, and, and I kind of tend to, to lean in this direction, that he was trying to trip him up a little. Because Satan is a master at using Scripture and twisting it or making us see it or, or, or use it in a way that was never intended. And so I kind of look at it as him saying, look, Scripture says if you jumped off of here, God's going to rescue you. Think about the publicity you get if that happened. I mean, if you jumped off and God rescues us in this dramatic way, people are going to see that. It's going to make the news tonight. And it's going to spread all over that, hey, the Messiah must be here because he jumped off the temple and God saved him. And that's going to bring people to you. You're going to have bigger crowds following you. It's a win-win. Satan is so good at twisting things, making Scripture sound like it's saying something it doesn't, uh, and, and, or causing us to use Scripture in a way that God never intended. I don't know how many times I, I've heard people uh, claim Scripture where it says, you know, I, will, I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten, which was a promise to a specific person in a specific place, and have taken that promise as a promise to them, or, or where scripture says, I know the plans for you, uh, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans for a future. And people, I've seen people take that, and that's my promise that God is going to do this particular thing for me. Years ago, uh, I had a fellow come to our uh, recovery group, and he came early one night while we were still preparing dinner. And we were just talking, and he, he was telling us about his life and what was going on in his life. And we weren't even in the groups yet. We were just preparing dinner. And he shared that, that you know, there had been some things at home domestically that had caused him to go to jail. Now he was out of jail, and he was trying to get his life straight. And he said, and I know God is going to bring my wife back to me. And I just, I, I just know that's going to happen because God hates divorce and so I know God is going to restore my family. And he was quoting these, these verses as if God was promising this to him. And so and I kind of cautioned him. I said, you know, those, those promises were made to specific people at a specific time. And it's not, it, they weren't promises designed for everybody. It doesn't mean that God is looking to harm us but it's dangerous to take hold of the, that as a personal promise because then if God doesn't answer the way I think he should or doesn't respond the way I think he should, then it can hurt our faith. And I've seen that happen where people grab hold of a promise that really wasn't made to them and they expected this from God and God didn't come through the way they expected and then it rocked their faith. And, and, and I've seen that happen and that's... Satan will get in and he'll, he'll take scripture and he'll twist it or he'll twist our understanding of it or cause us to grab hold of certain things that weren't meant the way they were supposed to, to mean. And I think this is what he was trying to do with Jesus. Whichever was true of Satan's attitude, he was trying to get Jesus to focus on himself rather than on others. But here's Jesus' response. Satan quoted scripture and Jesus answered him with scripture. Verse 7 says, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So now Jesus is quoting Moses' words to the Israelites when they were on their way out of the promised land. They had been trying to manipulate God the way a child manipulates or tries to manipulate his parents. You ever been in the store and listened to a child try to manipulate his parents? but I really want this and, and my friends have it and, and don't you love me? If you loved me, you would get this and, and I'd be happy. I, I've heard those kinds of manipulations before. And so often, we have a tendency, we're not as blatant as that, but I found in my life where I had to kind of stop myself and repent because I found myself sort of trying to manipulate God. And we'll think, okay, I did these good things over here, so God's going to reward me by doing this thing I want over here. 
had to be careful during the fasting and praying that I didn't have the attitude that says, okay, God, you see what I'm sacrificing over here. I'm sacrificing for you, so now you've got to do what I ask you to do. That's not what fasting is about. Amen. Fasting is about sacrificing ourselves, but putting ourselves in front of God to be aligned with His will. And yes, we bring our requests, and it is a way of saying, Lord, this, this means a lot to me. It means so much that, that I'm going to deprive myself. But it's not a matter of trying to manipulate God. We fast and we pray to align ourselves with God's will. But it's easy as a human being to slip into that mindset that says, okay, God, you know, I, I did this for you. You owe me now. That's what the Israelites were doing. That's what Jesus was quoting here. And Moses had come back to the Israelites and said, no, no, no. You, you don't manipulate God. And it's easy for us to fall into that same kind of mindset where we try to manipulate God. And Satan uses that. Jesus, whatever Satan's intent was, Satan's intent was to get Jesus to focus on himself. And Jesus' response is to focus on God, not him. And here's what's so amazing about Jesus. Throughout his ministry, Jesus didn't just teach he modeled what he taught. He taught, but then he modeled the things that he taught, especially at that time. That was relatively new. Nobody had ever seen it done well on a large scale that power isn't primarily for the benefit of the powerful. Most of the time, people would get in power and they would use that power to benefit themselves. And you've heard the saying, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts what? Absolutely. And it's because we've seen this over and over. People get into positions of power, and you would think, okay, they're in power now. They have power. They don't have to worry about threats. So they can use that power to benefit, to benefit other people. But over and over and over again, we see examples where people get into power and then they just go off the rails, morally, ethically, financially. They just seem to go off the rails. We've seen it from dictators throughout the 20th century, especially communist dictators who would, who would come to power promising, oh, we're going to put power in the hands of the people. It's all going to be the people who have the power. But amazingly, there's always a small group of the leadership who have it better than the ones who were there supposedly there to help. And that's why you saw in the Soviet Union, you saw the leaders, they were dining on, you know, on fine meals and they had cars and they never had to worry about possessions and what they had. They had all they wanted. And yet the people were standing in line waiting for bread. There's something about power the way we do things as human beings, we get into power and we don't use that power to help other people. We enrich ourselves. <clears throat> we try to solidify our power. We try to increase our power. We get influenced. And we try to use that influence to benefit ourselves. And Jesus came and he turned everything upside down. And that's what this, this last temptation is all about. Verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Everything as far as the eye could see. He says, all their glory, all their splendor. Verse 9, he says, all this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Luke's gospel adds this. It says, he said, that he said I will give you all their authority and their splendor. You can have everything. Imagine if somebody came up to you and said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, all of its power, all of its splendor. You can have all of it. You just have to bow down to me. And you don't have to do it for all your life. Just this one time. Just this one time, just for a minute. Who turns that down? 
I, I joke every once in a while that, you know, when I'm benevolent dictator of the universe, I'm going to do a certain thing. And almost every time it's something the way I want it to be. And because that's what happens when we get power, we do things to benefit ourselves. And so Satan comes and he offers this and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, the power and their splendor. Just bow down to me. Who says no to that? You know who says no to that? The people you look up to. Jesus says no to that. Jesus came to establish a different type of kingdom than the ones he was being shown by Satan there. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom that existed in our hearts. One that did things differently. A kingdom where wealth isn't leveraged on, on behalf of those who already have it. It's leveraged on behalf of those who don't have it. Where power is leveraged to help those who don't have power. Where influence is used to help those who don't have a voice of their own. That's the kind of kingdom Jesus came to establish. Verse 10 says, Jesus came, said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the text says that when the devil had finished all of his tempting, he left him. And Luke's gospel says, Until a more opportune time. In other words, this isn't the end of this. Satan has his I'll be back moment. And he was. He came back. Scripture says Jesus was tempted in every way that we were. This wasn't the last time Jesus was tempted. And he does that with us. Even when we have those moments, he ever had those moments where temptation hits you and you pray and the temptation passes and, and, and you're, you're happy about that. But you know Satan's saying, I'll be back. Another more opportune time, I'll be back. And the text says in verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news about him spread through the whole countryside. <coughs> and then, maybe despite the devil, I don't know, he went and he performed a miracle at a wedding where he didn't change stones into bread, he changed water into wine. And not because it benefited him, but because his mama asked him to. And there's a lesson there. Listen to your mama, not the devil. How many times have you got in trouble because you didn't listen to your mama? That's not the lesson here. It's a good lesson. That's not the lesson of this. <laughs> That's not the lesson here. But... Jesus is, is, is looking at things completely differently from the way the world does. Jesus is doing something different from the way the world does things. It means this, that what Jesus valued more than the kingdoms of the world was you. What Jesus valued more than all the kingdoms of the world was you and me. You mean more to Jesus than all the kingdoms, all the wealth, all the power, all the authority in the world. That's how much you mean to him. Because no matter how powerful you are, nobody can take care of the biggest problem you have in your life, and that's your sin. He's the only one who can. And he loved us enough that he came to earth. Scripture says that we're to have the same mindset that Christ Jesus had. This isn't in your outline. But said his mindset was this. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And then being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself even to the point of death. To the point of death on a cross. That was Jesus' approach to things. Totally upside down from the way things are done in our culture. To where you gain power and you use that power to enrich yourself. You gain authority and you use that authority to enrich yourself. Jesus said, no, you mean more to me. 
than any of the authority and any of the power that I could possibly have. And so the question he asks us, the question we have to answer is this, what good is it to gain all the kingdoms of this world, all the power, all the splendor of this world, if in the end you lose your very self? You lose your very soul. And that's the question we wrestle with. We know that the things that we chase after are temporary. We know that. In the back of our mind, we know when, when we're chasing pleasure or money or things or power, we know that those things are temporary. They don't last into eternity. And yet, we're still tempted to chase after those things to benefit ourselves. And Jesus says, what's the point? If you lose yourself in the process. Because when we focus on ourselves, we don't just hurt ourselves. We lose ourselves in the process. Jesus came to establish a different kind of kingdom. The kind of kingdom where the king doesn't benefit himself. The king steps down from his throne and sacrifices himself on behalf of the people he loves. Haley Bridges we worked at a, at a Chick-fil-A in, in Wisconsin and had a friend who worked there with her who had to ride a bike to work each day. And that's not so bad in the summertime, but winter in Wisconsin is not fun. My sophomore year at JMU, I didn't have a car. I lived off campus. I had a bike. It's one of the reasons I first grew a beard, because it was so blasted cold riding that bike back and forth, just something to protect my face. And she and her friend group there at, at her Chick-fil-A restaurant, they had a, there was a raffle for the employees at the end of the year, and the prize was a car. And all the people in their friend group got together quietly, and they said, look, if any of us gets the winning ticket, we're going to give the car to her so she won't have to ride a bike anymore. And Haley was the one whose name got chosen. Now look, I give all credit in the world to everybody in the friend group who said if our ticket, if, if my ticket gets called, uh, I'm going to give it up. But when you decide that ahead of time, that's one thing because it's theoretical. But when you hear your name called and you're holding on to that ticket and you know that means a new car, that's, that, that's different level friendship there. That's like this week at the seniors group when, when uh, uh, Darlene was talking about being short of breath. Shelly Kelly took her oxygen and said, here, you can, you can share my oxygen. <laughs> that's next level friendship right there, giving your oxygen to somebody. And, and so I, I give credit to all of them in the group, but you know, it's a little different when you're sitting there holding that winning ticket, you know that means a new car for you. And she gave that to her friend. That's the kind of attitude that Jesus came to foster, where I'm not focused on me. If I have power, if I have authority, if I have influence, I'm going to use that not to benefit myself. I'm going to use that to benefit others. And that's what Jesus did for us. The king who stepped down from his throne and sacrificed himself for his subject. Lord, the love that you show for us is beyond amazing. And sometimes it's beyond what our minds can really wrap themselves around because most of the time we just don't think that way. We, we tend to think of things in terms of enriching ourselves and, and, and benefiting ourselves more than other people. But Lord, thank you for the fact that Jesus came to establish a different kind of kingdom. One where it wasn't about him, it was about us. And Lord, we know we don't deserve it, we, we haven't earned that, but we are grateful for the love he showed us in that. And we pray that you would help us as we go through our days, that we would share the good news of the king who loved his people enough that he sacrificed himself for them. And we pray these things in his name.
If you have never <laughs> taken that offer and given your life to him, then we want to give you the opportunity to do that. We're going to stand together and we're going to sing that song of invitation. And if you have never given your life to him, been baptized in him, have your sins washed away, then we offer that invitation for you to do it as we stand together and sing this song. chapter in her life, and uh, we just want, wanted to take a minute and, uh, and thank her for, for all that she's done uh, while she's been here. There she is. Thank you. 
Ecclesiastes 3, 1 says that there's a season for everything, for every activity under the heavens. And um, today we experience a, a new season beginning, and certainly with new seasons, sometimes there's um, a mix of emotions, uh, joy and sorrow, and so it's a mix of that today. Um, but the season that we've had Pam, um, our, our worship has definitely benefited. Yeah. It takes consistency and commitment to make sure that there's not distraction during worship. And Pam has given us many years of making sure that we're not distracted. She's given commitment and consistency the whole time. And Pam, we can't thank you enough for all that you've given. We're going to miss you. Okay. So we have a uh, little we'll gift that we want to give you just as kind of a token of our appreciation for, uh, for the, the ministry that you have had here. And I want, us to, I want to close this morning. If you'd stand, I want us to close as we uh, as pray for Pam. In this, in this next chapter of her life and her ministry to, to the kingdom of God. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the brothers and sisters in Christ you bless us with, that, that the church is, is more than just an organization, it's a family. And Pam has grown up here and has served here for so many years in, in, in such a wonderful way, and your kingdom has been blessed by that. And as she moves to this new chapter in her life, in her, uh, in her service to you, we just ask your blessing on her, that you would take the gifts and talents that, that she has and use those to, to benefit your kingdom in an even greater way. And Lord, we pray your blessing on, on her uh, and, and uh, as she goes and does that. And we thank you for the blessing that she's been here. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that, that you would would help us to, to show that appreciation as our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you.